Did the ancient Greeks sail to Canada? Before I go into this uh, article by Rebecca Boyle, I just want to tell you that they did find Minoan ancient Crete DNA, the DNA of ancient people of Crete, the Minoan civilization, in the Native Americans of the Great Lakes region. And uh, we know that the early uh, settlers called them redskins. The men in ancient uh, Crete in the Minoan era used to paint their skin red because they believed they were more handsome that way. And the redskins, well, the Amer Native Americans used to paint the put soil on their skin to have that same color because they could have been from the Minoan culture. Now, did the ancient Greeks sail to Canada? Well, we know they were trading up to Scandinavia, uh, Scotland, northern, uh, north, uh, the areas of Scotland, and from there is hop, skip, and a jump towards uh, the uh, Hebrides and uh, Iceland and Greenland and, of course, Canada. So did the ancient Greeks sail to Canada? Researchers think Plutarch's De Facie tells the tale of Greek sailors making the treacherous transatlantic crossing. They dug into the science to show how it could have happened. Rebecca Boyle uh, re reveals to us. And the story of the European settlers of North America usually features a few main characters, red-headed Norsemen who sailed across an icy sea to set up temporary outposts, Spanish conquistadors, white-collared English separatists, French trappers and Dutch colonists. And now a team of Greek scholars prop proposes another and much earlier wave of European migration, the Hellenistic Greeks in triremes. This is a trireme, as you can see here. It has three rows of rowers. It also had sails. So uh, the... Um, Triremes powered by sail and oars in the first century AD, nearly a millennium before the Vikings. These ancient Greeks regularly visited what is now Newfoundland, the study's authors say. They set up colonies that lasted centuries, and they mined gold. They made recurrent trips every 30 years. Some travelers would, tra would return home after only a brief stay, but for others the voyages were one way, they came to know the North Atlantic, not the warm Aegean, as their home waters. Now, I remember uh, quite some time ago, I posted a video concerning a, um, an American university professor in the mid-1800s uh, mid who wrote to the chiefs of the Native Americans, and he wrote in their classical language. He wrote to them in Greek. He says, I'm writing to you, my brothers, in the language all you chiefs know, and it was in Greek. He says, I'm writing to you to warn you that because of the, all this influx of Europeans, your culture and heritage may not last very long. And that his letter to them was in Greek because that was the language they all knew and the alphabet they all knew. Isn't that something? There's a lot of things about American history we don't know yet. But anyway, going back to this, to be clear, there is no firm evidence of the ancient Greeks' purported voyages. There are no known physical remains of these historic Greek settlements in, the, in North America, nor are there first-hand descriptions of such journeys in anything but one account from antiquity. The idea is basically based enter, entirely on a new examination of dialogue written by the influential Roman author Plutarch, who lived from 46 to 119 AD. Our intention is to prove with modern science that it was possible for this trip to be made. Ioannis Lyridzis, archaeologist, University of the Aegean, who proposed that the ancient journeys took place, wrote in an email, Lyridzis presents his argument in a new paper co-authored with astronomer Panayota Preka Papadima, philosopher Konstantinos Kalachanis, meteorologist Chris Tanzis, and information technology consultant Panayotis Antonopoulos. Greek historians and maritime archaeologists 
Our worry, however, several people contacted for the story say Lilitsit's claims are unfounded and unlikely at best. To understand why Lilitsit and his colleagues believe ancient Greeks may have reached Canada, it is helpful to understand a bit about their source. Plutarch was a Greek historian and a Roman citizen who died around 120 AD. He was a prolific writer and biographer in On the Face Which Appears in the Orb of the Moon, often called simply De Fasi, several characters discuss whether the moon is another earth, whether it has life, and other philosophical questions. In one section, a character recounts meeting a stranger who had recently returned from a long voyage to a distant great continent. According to the stranger, new travelers would make the trip roughly every 30 years, when the planet Saturn appeared in the constellation Taurus, some travelers stayed behind on the continent and some would have returned, Lyrgis explains. Based on a close reading of Plutarch's texts, Lyrgis and his colleagues claim that this great continent is, in fact, North America. In the paper, the team argued that the Greeks could have used their detailed knowledge of astronomy to pinpoint the locations of Atlantic currents that could have borne them to the west. Indeed, the bulk of their argument is based on astronomy, and it all starts with the total eclipse of the sun. The opening chapters of De Fasse have been lost in history, so no one knows the exact date of the conversation it describes, but one clue contained in the story is a reference to a total solar eclipse that happened sometime around noon, Lyrizis and the others searched five millennia of eclipse records to find one that met the necessary parameters, including the time of day and the time at which Plutarch would have been writing. There was a total eclipse, a solar eclipse, in 59 AD, for instance, but Plutarch would, just ha uh, would have just been 14 years old at that time. Ultimately, the researchers settled on one eclipse which took place in 75 AD, Using astronomy software, the researchers saw that in the decades surrounding this eclipse, Saturn would have appeared in Taurus during three periods, from 26 to 29 AD, 56 to 58 AD, and 85 to 88 AD. The 75 AD eclipse was used to calculate the timing of the conversation between Plutarch's informant and the stranger who had traveled to the great continent. Based on this, Lyrgis and his colleagues timed the trip itself to the period when Saturn was most recently in Taurus, which is 56 AD. The researchers posit that preparations for the journey described by Plutarch's stranger would have commenced that year. The travelers would have arrived in North America in 57 AD, stayed for a year amid an existing Greek colony, and sailed home in the fall of 58 AD when Saturn moved out of Taurus. This was merely the most recent voyage to the time of Plutarch's writing. According to the text, such journeys took place every 30 years over a span of several centuries. The researchers' close reading of De Fasse leans on geography as well. In the text, Plutarch includes heading and distance estimates for the stranger's trip, which Lurizis and his colleagues included in their calculations. For instance, Plutarch wrote that the great continent lies beyond the Isles of Ogygia, which according to the text is itself a five-day trip by trireme west from Britain. Plutarch also write, wrote that the Greek settlers accessed the great continent through a bay that lines up with the Volga River Delta, the northern entrance to the Caspian Sea. Using Google Earth, Lyrgis drew a line from this location across the Atlantic and found it led to the Gulf of the St. Lawrence River. Lyrgis rejects counter-proposals that the putative great continent could have been Ireland, the Azores, or a location nearing to the Strait of Gibraltar at the mouth of the Mediterranean. Plutarch says they are the same geological latitude lying on the same parallel no relation whichever with Azores or otherwise, he says. Lyrgis says the Greek settlers may have journeyed for the sake of exploration, 
for riches or for religious reasons. He says that they would have made the journey when Saturn was in Taurus because they closely followed astronomical phenomena associated with Saturn, the mythical leader of the Titans, Cronus, that is, and the father of Zeus, the planet we know as Saturn, renamed by the Romans, was called Cronus by the ancient Greeks. The other archaeolog archaeologists say the occurrence of such a voyage is implausible, thought not necessarily, though not necessarily impossible. Hector Williams, professor of classical archaeology at the University of British Columbia, UBC in Canada, who studies underwater archaeology in the eastern Mediterranean, is just one of the many researchers contacted for, for, for the story who express skepticism at the idea that over centuries, ancient Greeks sailed back and forth to what is now Eastern Canada. While accidental pre-Columbian crossings are not impossible for Greeks and more likely Romans who were caught in the storm while on the coast of Western Europe, there is no evidence for regular crossings, William says in an email. Even the Vikings gave up their brief settlement in Newfoundland after a few years. Brendan Foley, an underwater archaeologist in Lund University in Sweden, who studies shipwrecks from antiquity, including the famed Antikythera shipwreck, took issue with most of the paper's assertions. There is simply no possible way that first millennia BC Mediterranean sailors would have a con any concept of the Atlantic Ocean currents, and they certainly did not possess the navigational technologies and knowledge a la Polynesian sailors, to position themselves in the open Atlantic Ocean to ride them, Foley wrote in an email. Well, they weren't in the open Atlantic. They were hop skipping and jumping from northern Scotland to, uh, towards the islands and connecting to Iceland, Greenland, and then uh, Newfoundland of, of Canada. Now, as one example of many, Foley refutes the proposed uh, motivation of the Greek sailors in their paper, Lyrgis and colleagues suggest the Greeks might have sailed to Newfoundland in search of gold and metals. Plutarch says the foreigners who returned from the great continent were carrying supplies inside golden cups. But as Foley points out, the gold mine in that region today is a byproduct of copper or production in underground mines. He adds that large surface deposits of gold of the sort that could be mined using ancient technology are scarce in that area. Foley says he is unaware of any analysis of Hellenistic artifacts that would show the gold within them can be traced to Newfoundland. And Foley says there's absolutely no evidence for this. He further points out that Greeks purported sailing speeds of 10 knots or, uh, or roughly 18 kilometers an hour is quite a clip even for modern ships. Lyrizis and his co-authors argued the sailors must have reached speeds of 9.7 knots to cover the distance Plutarch specifies, such as the distance between northern Britain and Iceland. Elsewhere in the ocean, the sailors would have typically reached average speeds of 3 knots, say Lyrizis and the colleagues. Ragmund Krivek, a physicist at the Joseph Stefan Institute in Slovenia, who has studied Greek trireme, says... The vessel speeds can vary, greatly, uh, can vary greatly owing to various modes of rowing, and much depends on the strength of the crew and the ocean conditions. What matters here is probably the long time sustained upper speed, he says. In the relatively calm Mediterranean, Krivek says that the triremes may have reached as much as three or four knots. They would have moved more slowly over the ocean. Yeah, but let's remember that the wind over the Atlantic is very stiff. It's a very strong wind. Now, if ancient Greek sailors did make it to Canada, it may have been an accident made while aiming for British or I Britain and Ireland, Krivek says. The Greek researchers acknowledge that their paper, in their paper that there is no evidence that the Greek sailors actually made these trips. They only set out to show its plausibility using interdisciplinary approaches and scientific evidence. That ancient Greeks made it to Scandinavia and the New World is not supported by archaeology yet, but the potentiality of such a hypothesis has been molded, modeled by arguments and the reaffirmation of astronomical, geographical, and oceanographical factors, he wrote. 
Leary, this is not the first to suggest ancient Mediterranean culture visited the Americas. The British author Gavin Menzies made a similar claim in his controversial book, The Lost Empire of Atlantis. He argues the fabled lost city of Atlantis was part of the Minoan civilization, abroad, from Crete that is, a Bronze Age society that populated the Greek islands of Crete from 2600 BC to about 1000 BC. But most classical archaeologists reject Menzies' ideas, including his claim that Minoan sailors reached the Americas. Some researchers have also suggested the ancient Phoenicians, a civilization that rose around 1000 BC in the Levant, well, they were Cretans. We know that is also written in the Old Testament of the Holy Bible. The Phoenicians were, the Phoenicians were even giants, and they were, many of them, six-fingered, and uh, they came from Crete. Now, some researchers have also suggested ancient Phoenicians, a civilization that arose around 1000 BC in the Levant, that's across from Crete, uh, the Levant being Lebanon, uh, Syria, Israel, near what is now Israel, Syria, and Lebanon, also reached North America. The Greek historian Herodotus, the father of history, claimed the Phoenicians circumnavigated Africa in 600 BC, supporting the idea that they were capable of long distance, they were capable long distance sailors. But most historians reject this and other similar claims of pre-Columbian settlements in North America, at least intentional ones, based on a total lack of archaeological evidence. UBC's William says the new theory put forward by Lyrizis and his colleagues remind him of all the effort that went into trying to make sense of the Atlantis legend, ultimately the scholars' claims reflect an impulse at least as old as Western civilization itself, not only to explore and seek adventure, but to spin epic yarns about adventures, adventurers' exploits. And this is on Hakai Magazine by Rebecca Boyle. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. Please support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.